Okay, so first of all, uh, apologies for the delayed lecture. I only got back here about one hour ago from Siberia. As you can see, the weather and the clothes are completely different, <laughs> okay? Uh, today, I'm going to um, describe once again a bit more detail about point groups. And the purpose of the lecture is that supposing that you know the lattice parameters and you know the shape of the unit cell, um, how does symmetry influence where you put the actual atoms inside the cell? Because the position where you locate the atoms will determining, determine how many atoms there are going to be in the unit cell. Okay? And when we finish that discussion of uh, point group symmetry and the use of point group symmetry to solve crystal structures, that means not just the unit cell lattice parameters, but you also uh, discover how many atoms of each kind there are and where they are located. When we finish that, I'll generalize stereographic projections to non-cubic systems. Okay. Now, there's been uh, quite a gap. Okay, so uh, first of all, let me apologize for the delayed lecture. As you can see, I was in uh, Siberia. And I got to Pohang just one hour ago, okay? So this is, this is what it looks like in Siberia. Many, many centimeters of snow. Okay, uh, just to remind you, uh, we actually used the stereographic projection to illustrate one particular point group, which is bar 2, where the bar stands for inversion through the center, and the two stands for a two-fold rotation axis. That means when you rotate by 180 degrees, you recover the original operation. And let's imagine that we have this arbitrary point here, okay, which is uh, on a stereographic projection. You would identify that by projecting it through the south pole, and the intersection there is that arbitrary point. What do I mean by arbitrary point? It's not located at a particular position of symmetry. It's just anywhere. Okay? So it's not 100, zero, zero, it might be 1.100, zero, zero, something like that, okay? Right, now I'm going to operate on this uh, by the twofold axis. Okay, so we've operated the rotation axis here by 180 degrees, and therefore you generate another point, which is also in the upper hemisphere. Okay. And now, you take this point and you invert it through the center because bar 2 stands for inversion and this point goes under the equatorial plane and that's identified by drawing an open circle so that's the bar 2 operation okay and what is that equivalent to Yeah, it's a, it's a mirror, isn't it? A mirror on the equatorial plane. So this is a particular point group, which is bar 2, a combination of symmetry elements passing through the same point, uh, which is a rotation of 180 degrees and an inversion through the center, and that's exactly the same as a mirror plane. And we've represented that on a stereographic projection by taking an arbitrary point, rotating it by 180 degrees, and... If I invert that through the center, it ends up on the other hemisphere, and therefore we draw it as a circle. So there you can clearly see that there's a mirror plane in the plane of the stereogram. Okay? So you can represent point group operations very easily on a stereographic projection, whereas this is much more tricky to draw. Okay, so in your notes, you'll find a group of stereographic projections. Uh, what page is that? Um, what's the page number there? Oh, page yeah, page uh, 90, 19, is it? What page is it? The, okay, 29. You find 32 different sets of stereographic projections. In one set, you have the symmetry element identified. In this case, it's a four-fold axis of symmetry. Okay? Uh, and in the second set, uh, you represent what happens 
when you take an arbitrary point, that means it's not located on a symmetry element, and you operate on it using that symmetry <coughs> element. Okay? Now, in this case, there are no mirror planes. But if there is a mirror plane, then that is drawn as a heavy line on the stereograph. Okay? So if you look at your uh, stereographic projections of the 32 different point groups, then you'll see some heavy lines representing mirror planes. I'll, give, I'll show you some examples of that. Okay? So this side represents the symmetry element, and this side represents what happens when you operate that symmetry element uh, using um, an arbitrary point to start with. Okay, is everyone happy with that? So the purpose uh, I mentioned, the purpose of today's lecture, uh, one purpose is that supposing you know the lattice parameters and so on, which you can determine using X-ray diffraction, uh, it's much more difficult uh, using X-ray diffraction to pinpoint where and how many atoms there are in the cell. Okay. For, for that, you need a lot more work. Uh, but using symmetry, you can simplify things dramatically. So I'm going to show you a very complicated crystal structure uh, and show you how symmetry allows you to determine how many of the different kinds of atoms there should be in the cell. But just to continue with this, uh, this is another operation, which is bar 3. Uh, that means that we rotate uh, an arbitrary point by 120 degrees and then we invert it through the center. So, uh, an inversion triad has a little hollow in the middle, uh, where the triad is just a complete uh, triangle. So, if I take uh, an arbitrary point, I rotate it by 120 degrees, and then invert it through the center, I get this, right? And similarly, if I take that point, rotate it by 120 degrees, invert it through the center, I get that. So, this represents the bar 3 operation. And it's very easy to show that three of them are pointing upwards and three of them are pointing downwards. Okay. If you try to draw that in three dimensions, you'd be, uh, you know, you, you may be artistic, but it would take you a long time to do it properly. Whereas on a stereographic projection, it's obvious what's happening. Okay? Okay, so these are the 32 possible point groups, and they are divided into the seven crystal classes. So the cubic class has the highest symmetries. Okay? Uh, and uh, within the cubic class, there are different kinds of point group symmetries. Um, for example, that's a bar 4 axis parallel to the z axis. You remember the point group notation. We start with the z axis, and normally we look at the symmetry elements along the x and y axis, but in the cube, the triad is very important. So the second element in the cubic uh, point group representation will always be a triad, okay? because the defining symmetry of a cube is that you must have four triads going along the body diagonals, the one-on-one -on -one directions. Yeah. And uh, so what was I saying? Yes, and the third element will be a mirror plane. Now notice that these lines here are heavy lines. Yeah. Uh, if you go to this, this line is not a heavy line. Okay. So when it, whenever it's a bold line, a wide line, that implies that there's a mirror plane there. Okay. Now, if you look at this, there's, there's an awful lot of symmetry elements. There's a four-fold axis, two-fold axis, three-fold axis, but not everything is written down over here. There's mirror planes and so on. So this is not a unique way of writing the point groups. Yeah. We've defined that first we'll write along the four-fold axis, then along the triad, and then along one of the x or y axis. Yeah. But if you use these symmetry elements, all the others are generated automatically. Yeah. So, so you don't need to say, OK, it's a bar 4, 3, m, 2, 3, and so on. Just that set of symmetry elements will reproduce everything else. Okay? So you can try it by taking an arbitrary point and operating it with a two and a three-fold axis, and you'll generate everything else that's uh, in that projection. Okay? Now, obviously, as we go to lower and lower symmetry, and the lowest symmetry system would be um, triclinic, in this case, uh, you just have a monad. That means 
you have to rotate by 360 degrees to recover the symmetry or uh, an inversion monad. So you rotate by 360 degrees and then you invert through the center. So this is the least symmetrical structure. Then you have monoclinic, orthorhombic. Uh, by definition, in an orthorhombic cell, you must have three dyads. Yeah, that's the defining symmetry. In tetragonal, the defining symmetry is there must be a single tetrad, right? Four-fold axis. So all of the tetragonal point groups will have a four-fold axis. Now, if you look at uh, these stereographic projections, uh, these crystal, uh, these have a center of symmetry, whereas the others don't. Okay? Now, if you have a center of symmetry, when you deform the material, uh, everything deforms symmetrically, so charges move symmetrically, etc., so you don't develop any potential. But if you have a non-centrosymmetric crystal, and I'll show you some examples later, then you will displace charges unequally with respect to the center of the cell, and therefore you might develop a, a voltage. So that's called what? What is that property called? When you deform, you create a charge. Piezoelectricity, uh, ferroelectricity, ferromagnetic, and so on. Those are not centrosymmetric crystals. Okay. So, you might argue, okay, we've got body-centered cubic iron, which is ferromagnetic. Yeah. So, what's wrong? Body-centered cubic iron is ferromagnetic at room temperature, right? It's not actually cubic. It's slightly tetragonal. Do you remember? I explained that the spins are aligned, right? Is everyone happy with so far with the interpretation of these point group stereograms? And remember, uh, sorry, you don't need to remember these. They are there for you to look at. It's not, uh, it's not a memory exercise. Uh, you can refer to those in standard tables. And when we get to space groups, which also include translations, there are many, many more. And a lot of people have done a lot of work to tabulate them, and they are available either on the web or as a, a reference book. It's not something to remember. You have the books to refer to. Yeah? But you need to understand what they mean. OK, so this is uh, a crystal uh, of lead titanate. So we have lead atoms here, uh, the pink titanium atoms, and the oxygen atoms. Okay? And this is a, uh, you're told that this is a tetragonal structure because you've done your X-ray diffraction and you find the lattice parameter here is exactly the same as here. Uh, but uh, although the oxygen atoms are located on the centers of the faces, the titanium atom is slightly displaced from half. And similarly, the lead atom is slightly displaced from a zero position. Okay. So it's a little bit of a tricky crystal. Can you first of all tell me what kind of uh, unit cell this is? Is it body-centered, face-centered, or primitive? It's tetragonal, OK? Primitive, because you're right. Yeah, the, the environment here is not the same as the environment here or here, right? This one is surrounded by these four oxygen atoms. Uh, this one is surrounded by these and, and so on. So how many oxygen atoms are there in the cell? Three. So we have uh, O3. And how many titanium atoms? So Ti and lead. So that is your formula, OK? Lead titanate. OK, so find some symmetry axes. So we know this is now a primitive lattice, OK? And the motif is that you place this at every 
corner of the cell. Okay? So this is the motif, which consists of a lead atom, a titanium atom, and three oxygen atoms. And it's a primitive tetragonal cell. Where is the fourfold axis? Because the definition of a tetragonal cell is that you must have a single fourfold axis. Where is the fourfold axis? Yeah, vertically down, that's right here. You can see that. Uh, any other symmetry axes? So I can, I can write this as primitive. And then in the point group notation, along the z-axis, we've seen there's a fourfold axis. What about along the x-axis? Right. Now, you're, you're absolutely right, okay? Um, diet and another diet as well, right? Yeah. Um, in fact, I would say that it's more than a diet. There's a mirror, okay? But it's difficult to see that, right? So what do we do to see it very clearly? Why don't we draw a structure projection with four unit cells, and that way you can see all the surroundings, right? Right, so this is a, a structure projection, and uh, these are four of the unit cells. And bear in mind that, uh, you know, because this is not a zero or one, I should really write the coordinate at every single blue point but uh, it will get messy. So I've indicated the coordinates of the lead as 0, 0, 0.116 or 0, 0, 001 plus 0.116, okay? And similarly, the titanium atom, uh, which is pink, is not located at exactly half height, but the coordinates are given here. So can you see where the mirror planes are? Yeah, so obviously there's a mirror plane here, and a mirror plane here. So I can write this as 4 mm, because a mirror is a higher symmetry than a diet. 4 mm. So this is the point group notation for the cell. If I ask you to focus uh, on the oxygen atoms now, do all those oxygen atoms have the same symmetry elements passing through them? So let's, let's look at this particular oxygen atom. What are the symmetry elements passing through it? You, you can look at this diagram. It might be easier. So remember, this is located at the top and the bottom of the cell. What are the symmetry elements passing through that particular oxygen atom? Yeah, there's a fourfold axis because it's, uh, there's a fourfold axis here. And clearly, you also have the, these mirror planes. How about this oxygen atom here? No, no, no. There's no fourfold axis there because look, this is different from this, right? Yeah, it's a it's a dyad, right? And similarly, this. So these have different point group symmetries than the oxygen atom located on the top face. Now, this is important because the number of each kind of oxygen atoms depends on the symmetry elements passing through it. And let's demonstrate that, okay? So, imagine that we don't know where the atoms are located, and I want to know how many, uh, how many of each kind of atom will arise if I put it at different positions in the cell, right? And the different positions will have different symmetry elements. So, if I just put it at x, y, z, where x, y, z is not a special position, then how many atoms do I expect? Well, we know this point group. And exactly as we did with the stereographic projections earlier, where, you know, I said, look, if we have a fourfold axis and I put an arbitrary pole on there, then I will end up with four because symmetry requires there be four. So if I had placed an atom at this position, I would end up with four atoms in the unit cell. So if I place an atom at x, y, z, 
when my point group is 4 mm, then how many should I have? Well, you do exactly the same sort of an operation and you work out how many atoms there should be. Okay, so this is our point group, 4 mm, and this is XYZ, it's an arbitrary 4. Okay, so if I operate the fourfold axis, the axis, then I get obviously these four. Okay, uh, then I have to operate the two mirror planes which are parallel to the fourfold axis. So these are now in heavy lines, you can see that. And therefore, how many atoms should I expect if I place an atom at XYZ? Yeah, to satisfy the symmetry, I would need eight atoms, right? So then you, you should, uh, you know what kind of an atom you're putting in guessing the structure, okay? Is the density of your phase right if you do that? If you place a titanium atom at that location, you will end up with eight titanium atoms in the cell. Therefore, you should know from the lattice parameters what the density of that cell would be. You can measure that experimentally and see whether your guess is correct, right? Uh, okay, let's carry on. So, by doing this kind of an operation, and, you know, we need not place it at an arbitrary point. We could place an atom here, we could place an atom here, and see how many equivalent positions we find. You can generate a whole table which tells you how many atoms you should find depending on where you put it in the unit cell. And those tables have all been calculated for all the point groups that uh, I... Um, illustrated. So, this is just the 4 mm, okay? Four-fold axis and two mirror planes there. Okay, um, here is a standard table which you can find in reference books or on the World Wide Web if you just look for point group tables. And what it's saying is that, look, if I place an atom at an arbitrary location, x, y, z, then I will have eight equivalent positions. We proved that already, right? On the other hand, if I place an atom at half, half, and Z, so for example, this one is at half, half, and a particular height, then I will expect just one. And clearly, we only have one because this is shared between two cells, right? So that's correct. Uh, if I place an atom at uh, this kind of a position, which is half zero Z, okay, then I expect two, and that's exactly what we have. One, two, three, four, divided by two, gives us two of those atoms. So, to solve for the crystal structure, you guess where the atoms are, and then you compare the consequences of that guess with measurements like density, uh, diffracted intensity will give you information as well, missing reflections, and so on. So the point group actually simplifies your life dramatically by simply